my name is Brian Wilson with two L's and uh, I just finished my it's called Blood on the Tracks, The Life and Times of S. Brian Wilson. About ready to hand cycle from Portland to San Francisco at the rate of about 40 miles a day um, on my book tour. My first public reading and signing, book signing is tonight at the People's Co-op, which is June 24th. And then tomorrow morning, June 25th at uh, 8 a.m. I leave. I wanted to be able to promote my book on my cycle rather than in a car. The book itself is a lot about our whole Western consumptive way of life and how destructive it is. I started my consciousness uh, when I was in Vietnam. I, I was a very straight kid growing up. I was actually quite um, a star in my small town. And then my military experiences and my Vietnam experience just kind of shook me to my bones and to my soul, I guess, and uh, I started walking on a different path. I spent a lot of time in uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador where President Reagan was uh, launching uh, wars against the poor. I was in a lot of villages. I saw a lot of killing. I knew the killing was happening because of U.S. weapons or U.S. money that was buying weapons for mercenaries. There was one moment in Nicaragua where I um, saw these uh, six bodies on uh, horse-drawn wagons coming in to, for burial in Esteli up in the mountains. And um, they had been killed by a counterattack nearby where I was living at the time. And, and I just saw those open caskets. It's kind of like I had a flashback to Vietnam right there. And it was like it all kind of synthesized in clarity that this is what imperialism is all about. It's about killing people who are in the way of whatever we want. Well, Blood on the Tracks because um, in 1987 I was uh, protesting the movement of munitions to El Salvador and Nicaragua from the Department of War's major arsenal on the west coast. A bunch of us were uh, vigiling at the, at the uh, base for several months and some people were blocking munitions trucks that were carrying the munitions to the ships and some people were blocking trains. So I finally decided on September 1st, uh, I, which was three months after we started, I would start a 40-day fast on the tracks blocking the trains. That day, an extraordinary event happened in that the train, which always stopped if there was anything on the tracks, accelerated to three times its five-mile speed limit, and I uh, didn't get all the way in time and uh, went under the train and lost my legs. So. It was my blood on the tracks. So between here and San Francisco, I'll probably have done uh, 700,000 revolutions. And so that equals a new way of moving, which is what this logo on my shirt represents. Uh, it's Gandhi sitting at a bicycle wheel rather than a spinning wheel, and there's a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis. The caterpillar really battles the me a metamorphosis to a butterfly, and it's, a, it's an intense battle. But the butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, and the butterfly is, you know, treads very lightly and pollinates, whereas the caterpillar devours. And it just is a metaphor for going from a car wheel to a bicycle wheel, and moving from a car culture to a bicycle culture. So, 700,000 revolutions of my wheel equals a major revolution of transportation policy. Brian, uh, have you done any public access TV? It seems to me I've seen you before on TV. Uh, well, over the years, yes, at different places I've mm -hmm. lived. In, uh, mm -hmm. Massachusetts and New York and California and in Oregon. Yeah, occasionally. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, I was reading your bio. I forget where it was. It might have been on your uh, Facebook page. And uh, it mentioned that uh, you started out on the starboard side rather than the port side. Yeah, you? Uh, <laughs> you might talk a little bit about your your un younger upbringing because uh, you were you were raised pretty much uh, gung ho American Republican. 
I thought everybody was actually. Where I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and uh, uh, you know everybody was. Um, this was in the fifties, so the golden era of American post World War Two capitalism. Yeah. Everything was hunky dory, even if it wasn't. You thought it was hunky dory. I like Ike. And uh, so yeah, I, I grew up in a very small farming community. Republican family, which when it when there was a little bit difference between Republicans and Democrats in those days, uh, not so much now. Um, I was a Boy Scout, you know. I was I um, loved high school. I was a jock. Uh, went on to college. Uh, was planning to be a Baptist minister, and then um, had a little shift there in uh, at this Baptist college I went to and. Um, decided to go to law school instead, went to law school, and then got drafted uh, during the, in the Vietnam War. So uh, that was, uh, I, and I was for the war, so, um, but I wasn't for fighting in the war. In those days they called that a chicken hawk. A chicken hawk. They still you do. Were, <laughs> you were a hawk on the war, but you were a chicken, you didn't want to go fight in the war. So that's what I was. I was a chicken hawk, and I thought for certain I was going to escape. Uh, but I got drafted, so, so I enlisted in the Air Force for four years rather than going in the Army. What year did you enlist? 1966. 25 years old. Mm -hmm. um, old for going in the military and not being a lifer. Um, and then, you know, in 69 I was in Vietnam and that uh, pretty much changed my life uh, from that point on till the present. I, I uh, basically uh, had both a traumatic, a series of traumatic experiences, but I also had an epiphany that actually completely altered my consciousness and my philosophy. While you were in Vietnam? While I was in Vietnam, and I was a commander. So I had 40 men under my command, and I, I, um, I was in an Air Force ground unit, and um, which itself was a little unusual. and. Um, but as soon as I had these experiences, I um, I became very anti-war, and I spoke out to my superiors every day about my feelings about the war, and that was just an attempt to uh, keep my sanity. Because it wasn't I wasn't going to stop mm -hmm. the war. I wasn't going to stop anything by my um, expressing my outrage at my at my superiors. But I was doing it because I, what else do you do? You, you just have to say this is this is wrong. This is illegal. This is criminal, and that was just to keep my sanity. Mm -hmm. um, Didn't make it too popular, I would imagine. No, I got sent home early. After, actually, after five months, I was sent home um, and had still had time to do in the military, which I did another year in the states. Um, and uh, there was some threat of a court martial, but that never happened, and I got out at four years as a captain with an honorable I was very happy to be out and um, but the war was still going on when you got oh out. yeah I, I got out in 1970 oh yeah so uh, so, um, so then I resumed law school which which is what I've been studying and I already had a master's degree finished law school and and um, next thing um, I know I'm discovering I can't uh, comply with the protocol of the courtroom as a lawyer, uh, you know, you have to stand up for the judge. And uh, my body didn't want to stand up for the judge. But We're calling it, me it, your it, honor. It isn't anything, it wasn't anything personal with the judge. It was a very uh, deep visceral feeling like um, so there was something wrong with automatically deferring to an authority figure after I had been in the military and I had been a loyal guy. and. I think my body just didn't want to be loyal anymore. My brain was saying, just do it. you got to do this if you want to be a lawyer. And right. uh, my body was saying, I mean, it was really strong because it, I, my muscles just weren't working to stand up. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, that ended my legal career really fast. And, um, and the book describes the journey, Blood on the Tracks, A Life and Times of S. Brian Wilson, describes my journey from this little rural conservative kid, commie hating, Baptist, uh, baseball loving kid <laughs> to uh, Vietnam and um, and many chapters since Vietnam have unfolded. 
Well, I, I understand from your bio that you came back, and what led up to you to your your injury was the fact that you were you were protesting arms shipments. I think to South America. I was protesting, uh, yeah, arms shipments to Nicaragua and El Salvador. Uh, but I, I had I was doing a lot of things before that happened. It's just that that uh, I mean I was doing a lot of uh, political activities to raise consciousness about uh, Reagan's policies in Central America all through the early 80s. Uh, at at one point I was director of a veterans outreach center in Massachusetts. I was very political then, but I was. I was not talking about politics as director of the outreach center. I was doing that on the weekends and mm -hmm. off time. Um, and some of the vets found out about it. and They didn't like it, but I wasn't. I wasn't mixing it up with my work. I was dealing with PTSD, with vets, and Agent Orange, and so forth. So um, I finally went to Nicaragua in '86. I resigned my job and went to went to uh, Nicaragua, and that's. I worry. Just start having a series of experiences in the war zones, and um, you know, there's only so much uh, demonic uh, behavior you can, and knowing that my country was creating the demonic behavior, mm -hmm. destroying villages and health clinics and schools and assassinating teachers and doctors and so forth, it's a no-brainer, really. You know, mm -hmm. that's not acceptable behavior. So. Uh, I started educating. I mean, there were thousands of people, quite frankly, that were doing similar things in the United States in those years. It was called the Central American Solidarity Movement, and I was just one of one of thousands of people. Um, but I was uh, I was really interested in getting other veterans involved uh, in the Solidarity Movement. So that's what I kind of focused on. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that uh, I've heard talk about Nicaragua, and uh, we our soldiers weren't down there doing it. We were there, weren't we? Just backing up what the, the the oppressive government down there was doing. Well, it depends on whether you're talking about El Salvador or Nicaragua. We were funding the repressive government of El Salvador with about a, a million dollars a day. Uh, with a death squad government basically fighting uh, guerrillas who were trying to achieve a little bit of justice after after decades of living in a feudal society basically being slaves and we supported the, the United States supported the families that were the 14 or 15 the land families owners. that were controlling the land mm -hmm. and uh, so we, that's what we were doing in El Salvador but in Nicaragua there was a revolutionary government that we were funding uh, opposition to. We were funding, we created something called the Contras, Contra terrorists. Mm -hmm. And they were training in Honduras, going across the border into Nicaragua. Some trained in Costa Rica going off to, across the border from the south. And uh, that was all through the 80s. And, uh, but there was a, there was a government that came into being in Nicaragua after 40 years of repressive U.S. dictator Somoza. They overthrew Somoza and started a, a new society and that was not acceptable to the United States because we no longer had had Nicaragua as our playground, as our banana republic, as our, you know, right. exploitable. Kind of like Cuba all over again. Yeah, so uh, that that was, so those two countries were kind of opposite of each other, but the United States was involved, want to keep propping up a repressive government and the other one, we were propping up a repressive terrorist force to, out to overthrow an elected government. An elected government, which you know has been, you know, we we did that in Iran, we did that in Iraq, you know, either the seventies or the eighties. Uh, person has a person during those years had a lot to complain about, and uh, what what got your injury was was the. Uh, the arm shipments on trains. Yeah, well, I we found out where the arm shipments were coming from that were going to El Salvador and Nicaragua. Where they were coming from Concord, California Naval Weapons Station, and we started vigiling there in the summer of 1987. You said that's Concord, so that's like east, east, 30, outer 30, east 30, bay, 35 miles east of San Francisco. Right. And um, so people were getting arrested through the summer of '87. I was just a jail support person. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting arrested. I was and uh, decided that on September 1st, which was the one-year anniversary of my having fasted on the steps of the Capitol the year before, 
with three other veterans that protested Reagan's policies. We fasted for 47 days on water only. Um, so it was exactly a year later, I decided I would start a 40-day, not an open-ended fast, but a 40-day fast on the tracks, uh, basically in front of the trains, which were, had a speed limit of five miles an hour, and they always stopped for people that were, they stopped for anything that was on the tracks. Uh, the trains only carried high, highly explosive munitions. That's what these trains were. Three miles a track from the bunkers to the ships where they were loading them. And um, so I knew there was no really danger. It was just a matter of uh, being arrested and taken to jail. And the penalty was a $5,000 fine and a year in prison. So I knew that. And there was two other vets that joined me on that day to fast for the 40 days. And on that day and that day only, the train sped up to three times its speed. The first train that came after we were on the tracks that morning of September 1st, 1987, uh, turns out the train speeded up to more than three times the speed limit. They were going 17 miles an hour. They would never have done that. We were there all summer. They usually go three or four miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, I woke up in a hospital um, not remembering anything. I still don't remember what happened. But there were 40 of my friends there that witnessed it, plus five photographers and a videographer. And a lot of the photos are in this book, the Blood on the Tracks. Um, so uh, I was told what happened. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter I discovered that the train crew had been ordered not to stop that day for fear that I was going to hijack the train. And where would they come up with that idea? Um, <laughs> the, uh, it turns out that uh, the FBI had investigated me and one of the other veterans that were on the tracks that day as domestic terror suspects. So I guess at that point we were expendable. Uh, but we didn't know that at the mm -hmm. time. And there was an FBI agent who was fired over this case. Uh, and that's how we really knew about the uh, FBI investigation. Cause fired he, because? He refused to investigate me and five others as domestic terror suspects because he said we were nonviolently protesting Reagan's violent policies in El Salvador and Nicaragua. He had it right. Mm -hmm. And he was at 20, almost 22 years in the FBI. So he just blew his career off then? He lost his career over it, that's correct. What became of him? Uh, he came to the Veterans for Peace Convention here uh, last yeah. month in Portland. Um, he's uh, he lives in Peoria, Illinois. He's um, he's a, he has a little sailboat, and um, he uh, he's been involved with the Catholic Worker Movement in, in Illinois. And mm -hmm. um, well, he continued down. Oh yeah, that he, road he, we, we've been we've traveled together to. Nicaragua and um, to ha to Haiti to Korea, um, yeah, we've become f fast friends. Mm -hmm. So it would seem to me that since that happened, that uh, you you must have or somebody must have tried to bring some charges or some investigation, whatever became of that. Well, if, if we tried. At all. We tried to get um, the Contra Costa County district attorney and the state attorney general of California and the U.S. attorney general to file charges, criminal charges against the train crew and their superiors. And they said there was no crime. And everybody that was present that day knew it was an intentional act because uh, they accelerated the train. They never, they, you just don't mm -hmm. do that. And there was always a provision to be arrested. There were 350 armed Marines that protect that base. And they just stood there and watched. And the Navy ambulance came within a couple minutes and apparently told my partner at the time who was stopping the bleeding in my legs that I wasn't lying on Navy property and therefore uh, they couldn't, didn't have jurisdiction over taking me to a hospital, which is pretty... Uh, pretty weak. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's incredible that they did that. Um, so what happened was we filed a suit in federal... We filed a civil suit against the train crew and the Navy. The Navy official report actually was quite good. It said um, that the train crew saw us for 650 feet, absolutely did not do anything to, to uh, break the train. Uh, not only did they not break, but they accelerated the train. 
uh, they had clear visibility and um, the, the Navy report recommended that the train crew and three levels of chain of command above them be suspended for three or six months. Uh, not bad for official Navy report, uh, right. even though it was attempted murder. But that report was um, was squashed by the Secretary of Navy. And so then we sued in, in civil court, and after three and a half years, uh, we, we settled rather than have a trial. Probably it was ended up better off by settling than you would have if you'd have gone all well, the way Well, we wouldn't have. The problem was that you can't sue the government for the, the uh, criminal acts of its employees. You can only sue the government for the negligence of its employees. And our case was so strong, it was good, we were not going to prevail because we would have proven criminal intent and the government's not liable, liable for, for the behavior of their employees who exhibit criminal intent. Mm -hmm. They're only liable if they're, if they're negligent. negligent. And that's our it. case was strong enough that it clearly was not negligence. Mm -hmm. That's admit. So I we never, would have lost the case. I never knew about that distinction. So it's really kind of a catch-22 oh, there. It was a t very depressing catch-22, actually, when I realized it. Well, it just you know, changed the course of your life. Well, uh, along with many other things over the, over the years, <laughs> over the uh, years. you know, everything is a, it's a life's a journey, it's a destination, and uh, mm -hmm. you don't know we don't know what's going to happen. I thought September first, eighty seven, was a sure thing of getting a train to stop for like five minutes, get the photographs, shows that the train can actually stop for people, and then we'd be dragged off. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't imagine it not happening that way. Uh, and so when I woke up in the hospital four days later, um, I realized, well, I'm not in charge or anything. You know, I can make great plans, but uh, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, there's someone else and writing then, that script, huh? And then on the fifth day, actually the fourth day after I was hit, 9,000 people showed up and ripped up 300 feet of the tracks. And the police just watched because there were too many people. Mm -hmm. And they stacked up the railroad ties. And, and then for 28 straight months, that no train could get through without being blocked by a, a whole camp on the, an encampment on the tracks at that site mm -hmm. it was there full time day and night for 28 months and no train or truck because there was a truck par a road paralleling the tracks where trucks were carrying munitions as well as the trains mm -hmm. down to the port so the trains got through the trucks got through but not without, over the course of time, uh, more than 2,000 arrests. Um, several people had their arms broken by the police. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was kind of a stupid thing for the government to do, really. Well, that but was they often don't think things through. No, and that was before the, the, the current militarization of the police. I mean, nowadays, I think that the, they'd be out there in their ninja outfits and uh, I, I don't be think shooting it, us. that'd be shooting us. That's right. That would be. It'd be a whole different situation. And you know, you know, being that we're on our media here right now, my own mind always goes to media. That was back when uh, media covered the issues that happened. Uh, we just had the 17th. We just had the day of of rage all over this country, where hundreds of people were were meeting in different towns, uh, expressing their rage at where this country is going. And not too long before that, there was all those arrests and. Was it D.C. over the, um, tar sands. the tar sands and not one iota of coverage on any of the corporate medias and now there's something going on tomorrow called the, the Moving Planet. Uh, I might mention that folks that are tuned in. You, it's, it's at the Memorial Coliseum, I think it is. And it's going to be like uh, from 12 to 3. Uh, Senator Merkley is, is going to the keynote speaker. They're going to have speeches. They're going to have a parade. The idea is you do, you get there by foot, by cycle, or, uh, or public transportation, mm -hmm. but not by car. Not by car. I don't know. You know, it's going to tell us. Attempted. It's, it's attempt to get people to change to people's to their thought patterns and their behavior to break the addictions mm -hmm. to fossil fuels. So it's it's a lot of that is just uh, taking the extra time that it takes to get to a well, to a bus. And because no, the blip, the century of the blip of oil, speeded everything up uh, in a way that's not even healthy, but we're now addicted to that way of life, to the one century blip which is not going to be repeated. That blip 
of because of the unsustainability of it. Well, right? it just it, it, and there's not going to be another century of oil, right? right. Of, of this free flowing oil, and so we got hooked on a way of life enabled by oil, which is a very efficient energy mm -hmm. fuel. Uh, it's just that it's not endless because planet's finite. Everything on the planet is finite. And we also, every carbon molecule that we are emitting in the air from generation of electricity to produce this show, to uh, drive cars, uh, every, car, every carbon molecule is now a particle of mass destruction. That could lead to something worse than nuclear winter. I mean, we, we are totally out of control with our way of life that's actually ironically destroying our life. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I like to say that the uh, post-World War II Cold War, which was really a hot war of the haves against the have-nots all over the world under the cover of fighting communism, killed at least 20 if not 30 million people. And we were building nuclear weapons to keep up with our enemy, Russia, and then lots of conventional weapons, including napalm and white phosphorus and all kinds of new bunker buster bombs and so forth, all to protect our way of life. Which was steeped in oil. <laughs> which itself is killing us. Mm -hmm. So isn't that kind of astounding that we, are, we, we build up all this military to protect our way of life and our way of life itself is the killer? Mm -hmm. Wow. You couldn't, it'd be hard to write a science fiction story yes. with that, that dark. Exactly. And so we're at this, uh, and I talk a lot of, about this in my book. So uh, you, you do, you do. This book is about industrial, civil, the, the, the uh, pathology of industrial mm -hmm. civilization and my journey as a young person, now an old elderly person, trying to unravel from my own conditioning uh, to do something so absurd as to follow an order to go 9,000 miles from my hometown with weapons to participate in destroying another culture I knew nothing about. Now that mm -hmm. is absurd. Now at the time, it's just what you do, it's, it's considered normal, it's patriotic, typical. Patriotic duty. It's been going on for centuries. But uh, in hindsight, I realized that my ta part of one of my tasks coming out of Vietnam was to explore who am I and what am I all about? Am I just a, 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 a blind, obedient person to be able to, to adapt to what the society says I should do? Or is there some other dimension? I mean, after all, we've been unfolding for five million years as a hominid. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's got to be some other meaning to life other than saying yes sir, no sir. And so a lot of this book is my journey to discover how, how um, we got stuck with this notion of obeying a vertical authority structure, which really is not what we're designed to be doing as human beings. And, uh, and of course I'm describing my journey with the idea that perhaps other people could um, take from my journey that it's kind of a metaphorical map for how mm -hmm. we liberate ourselves from this heavy conditioning into compliance with authority systems uh, which enable, which actually uh, condition us to go against our healthy selves. In other words, we're, we're conditioned to be individualistic rather than co rather than um, community oriented, we're, we're conditioned to be competitive rather than cooperative, we're conditioned to be ac acquisitive rather, rather than, than inquisitive, inquisitive right. acquiring things. No, that is not what I'm, that's not what we're about. That's what we think we're about because that's what we've known since we were born. Mm -hmm. But it's all been shaped by the political economy that we grew up in. and. Uh, and I found for myself that it's a pathology that practically destroyed me, my humanity. And so the, a lot of the book is description of my recovering my humanity. I'm a recovering white male, that's what I say. I'm a recovering white male, rediscovering 
who I really am as a human being on a planet with millions and billions of other life forms, including other humans, in a universe that's awesome, and um, it just is absolutely astonishing to me that I could have grown up and lived for 27 years without questioning any of the assumptions mm -hmm. uh, that I was, that I, you know, that I basically didn't even know I was all these assumptions that are part of me being a, a, an adjusted person. When I came back from Vietnam, I discovered I wasn't very well adjusted. Why? Because I couldn't adjust to a way of life that no longer made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that. You know, uh, I'm still struggling with it, but um, <laughs> probably always will. Yeah, yeah, I always will be. But the, so a lot of the book is about this description of where we are in industrial civilization and a uh, modern man. And, and you know, I, I cite in there uh, a, a, a question an Amish blacksmith used to ask me as a kid: What are you moderns going to do when the electrons stop? Mm -hmm. And I laughed, mm -hmm. laughed, ha ha. That's now it seems quite prophetic. Mm -hmm. what it's are profound. We do? Yeah, what are we going to do when the electrons stop? And they are going to stop at some point because mm -hmm. they're basically required the burning of fossil fuels to generate the electrons. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can get a little bit of solar, a little right. bit of renewable, but nothing that's nothing comparable to the level of life that we're dependent upon now for our consumption of everything from all these handheld electronic devices, all of which require electricity, electricity or batteries and electricity. And, um, and now I find out that uh, these precious metals that are needed for cell phones and iPods and computers, most of those minerals have been mined out of the Congo. It's like five or six mm -hmm. major precious metals, they call them precious metals. And in the process of, of uh, that exploitation, uh, 10 million Congolese have been murdered it's similar in 15 to the, years. Similar to the blood diamonds thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have to realize that our modern way of life has outsourced all the pain and suffering out of our view, out of our feelings self, so that we can continue doing it without thinking about it, without feeling any, any of the suffering that's going on. The chickens are going to come home to roost. They are already kind of in the early phase of coming home mm -hmm. to roost. It's called karma, or if you will, what goes around, what goes comes, around, around. comes around. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. that's a universal principle. We we cannot avoid it. Well, you know, the media is spending all their time and all their uh, their money and efforts in order to keep us in the dark, and they're being very successful at it. Well, they're corporations. They're part of the mm -hmm. system. They uh, they need to be in denial. Because when you come out of denial and realize what's happening, you actually change your life, and you realize, well, you're now, um, you're now kind of a, a threat to the paradigm that people believe in, like this mythology of the United States being a democratic country committed to justice for all, which is just a social uh, myth that covers over the secret that we've been an oligarchy all all along, committed to expansion. Uh, prosperity through expansion, profiting a few at the expense of the many. Really, that's what we're about. And because we've had enough material things since World War II for a middle class, which is now pretty much gone, we've been insulated from reality. Mm -hmm. But these are blips in history that have shaped us that are very, that are, aren't permanent. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in continuing as a species. I'm, con I'm interested in continuing um, the um, I the evolution of our species that re now requires a radical shift in the way we think and the way mm -hmm. we live if we want to survive. The stakes are high. Yeah, I, I would think extinction extinction is pretty high. Well, it's you know we're not we're not uh, we're not uh, immune from the the possibility of extinction, mm -hmm. and this century. Mm -hmm. That's how fast the convergence of economic crises, climate instability, and resource depletion. We're running out of copper, selenium, uh, oil, and clean water. Can't live without water. Yeah, a billion people on the planet don't have access to clean water. Exactly. And, and that's, that's gonna, you know, as the 
global warming continues and uh, these well, like Texas and even in this country you can see that uh, water is going to be at a premium you know we've already used up 36 minutes of the program and we've talked about a lot of issues and a lot of uh, Brian's life and uh, he brought along some photographs that are going to kind of give you some visuals of, of what we've been talking about so maybe we can start going through those and we can just talk over them a little bit here uh, we'll get Kelly on the graphics machine there we go oh well, there's a well that's my uh, Boy Scout Troop 41 Asheville New York 1953 I still remember the names of all those kids really my, uh, Boy Scout Troop I was six years old at that time. Yeah, I was uh, I was uh, twelve. Uh huh. And um, yeah, that was uh, that was quite. How'd you manage to hold on to that picture all them years? <laughs> I have a whole box of uh, archives, and yeah. I, when I go through them, I find all kinds of photos, you know. That uh, and, and and that picture's in the book too. Those pictures are. One hundred twelve photos in the book. Mm -hmm. um, all so, right. Now here's you in oh, the here service. Here I am. Uh, I'm uh, basically a commander of uh, that unit. Uh, I'm standing to the right. Uh, that's part of my uh, part of my fire teams, and that's at Phan Rang, Vietnam, in June of 1969. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of hard for me to believe that that was me that I was there, but um, you know that was. Uh, it's like I pinched myself. Oh yeah, that was that's the <laughs> same person. That you was know. a whole lifetime ago. When I got out of the military, I finished law school, became a member of the bar in Washington, D.C., and that's my first bar ID card. Is that Sidney? Yes, yeah, Sidney Brian Wilson. Uh -huh. I go by S. Brian Wilson now. And, um, yeah, that was a... I kind of laugh when I look at that picture. <laughs> that was that takes you back. That picture was taken in 1972. Mm -hmm. That's the year I moved to Portland. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, I didn't... Didn't, wasn't a lawyer for long. Uh, here I am with the shirt Stop the Olympic Prison. I, uh, I have a master's in criminology and I've done a lot of work on um, actually trying to stop new prisons from being built because um, uh, they just kind of aggravate the problem. And this was in uh, at Lake Placid, New York. They were building a federal prison up there in concert with the Winter Olympics of 1980. This was picture was taken in 78, 1978. So it's just I'm talking to the building, the contractor that's building the prison, and just um, saying, you know, I'm there to question all this, and and uh, uh, the whole decade of the '70s, I was pretty involved in what I call the examining, the care, carefully examining the um, criminal injustice system, and how inf how incredibly unfair it is based on class and race. Uh, the class and race determines everything. If you're poor and you're poor white or poor black or black or you know, any color, Indian, you're not going to fare very well in the <coughs> criminal justice system. Whereas, in uh, after reading the Pentagon Papers and from my own experiences in Vietnam, of course I knew that we were committing massive amount of crimes against whole nations of people, mm -hmm. and those people were presidents and being reelected. And and although Nixon resigned in lieu of a possible impeachment, he, uh, we were killing. We killed six million people in Asia, and to think that those people that are orchestrating that killing um, ha have no accountability whatsoever, whereas. The people in the criminal justice system are poor whites and poor blacks. Here I am mm -hmm. uh, in front of a Vietnam Veterans Outreach Center. I was the director of that center for two years in Massachusetts uh, in the 80s, um, dealing with uh, filing claims for PTSD, Agent Orange. Uh, I was dealing with a lot of homeless vets. Uh, I was part of uh, Governor Dukakis. He was the Massachusetts governor at the time. This is in Massachusetts. I was part of his Homeless Veterans Task Force. And so uh, I was very involved in dealing with, with veterans' issues. And I didn't realize they talked about PTSD that far back. Oh, yeah, started in uh, 1980. Mm -hmm. And that was in 83, 84, 85, I was doing that. And I know a lot of the uh, recent uh, Veterans for Peace conference talked a lot about that. Yeah. It's getting, yeah. it's finally getting to be... Well, uh, the, us veterans won't forget it. We don't want to f the country to forget about it. It was a huge, it's the most... Uh, intensive use of chemical warfare in human history. Mm -hmm. And um, here I am, 
on the, on the commons in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I'm in the center there holding that sign, uh, Reagan, bring our troops home alive. It's, uh, this is the morning of the bombing of the Marines at the Beirut home, 11 Beirut. in barracks, 241. Yeah, 241. And so we went out there on the commons that morning and uh, just in a state of rage. Uh, all three, the other two guys holding signs are also Vietnam veterans that lived in the area. And um, the other people are just locals that were joining us. And yeah, that was uh, that was in October, I think that was October 25th, 1983. We weren't even uh, in any kind of confrontation there. We were just... Well, a yeah, that was... T well, yes, right. We were supposedly peacekeepers or something after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which had killed 20,000 um, Palestinians. And that was two days after we invaded Grenada. Mm -hmm. So... Grenada was, I think, October 23rd, 1983, when we, and, and people didn't even know where Grenada was. Grenada? Still don't, I'm sure. Still don't, and <laughs> this was two days later, so we were, we were outraged at the invasion of Grenada, and then blowing up the 241 Marines dying. It's a, it brings back a extremely intense visceral um, memories and body experiences. You just, you, you know, sometimes uh, you think uh, you start thinking of suicide. You don't know how to deal with the uh, demonic nature of this, these policies that we've participated in. Uh, there I am in uh, June of 1985. I'm sitting in the front left. Uh, John Kerry's in the front center. He had just been elected senator of Massachusetts and a uh, U.S. senator, and his first time he was in the Senate, and we. There were 12 of us in that picture, besides Carrie and the person in the back that, whose house we were having the party at. This was a party that Carrie gave for the 12 vets that were called his dog hunters. We went all over the state campaigning for him, and uh, his brother said that if it hadn't been for our campaigning, Carrie wouldn't have won. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, this was a thank you party at uh, this house in Boston. And I was the only one that didn't wear a black tie. <laughs> it was a black tie party, and I just couldn't get myself to wear a black tie. And Carrie and I have had a falling out since then. But uh, I was going to ask about that. But uh, we had a falling out in '87. Uh, there, it's a fa I mentioned the veteran, the Veterans Fast for Life that I participated in September 1st to October 17th, 1986. I'm sitting on the right. Um, this was in protest of Reagan's policies in Central America, Guatemala, Salvador, Nicaragua, and, and uh, the guy in the uh, uh, third from the left, Charlie Litke, he was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner from Vietnam. George Maizo on the left, a Vietnam veteran with 12 uh, medals and heavy combat experience, and the guy in the red shirt, Duncan Murphy, World War II vet who uh, was in the unit that liberated Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany in 1945. Wow. And so we'd all been in Central America investigating U.S. policy and we decided that we wanted to fast. Uh, didn't know what else to do. Congress kept funding the policies. We just said, we'll sit on their front steps and uh, start whittling, you know, dwindling away. And after 47 days, one of our members was near death, and we decided to stop the fast. Mm -hmm. But that's the that's the action that put us on the FBI's domestic terrorist watch list. Strength. Fasting, huh? That <laughs> fasting on the step. Uh, there I am, and um, I'm on the left there, holding the banner on the, the right side of the banner. That's four of our 11 members of the Veterans Peace Action Teams that I helped... Uh, create in 1987. We spent a lot of time in the war zones of Nicaragua uh, confronting the Contras um, in, up in Hinotega and Matagalpa provinces. And this was part of our 75 mile walk we did to the Honduran border in, in March of um, 87. Um, and it was just, um, there was two women and nine men on that, uh, nine veterans on that uh, delegation, and we spent seven weeks in the war zones, uh, and then came back and tried to educate more to the people in the United States what's really going on there. You know, it's always a tough, tough thing. It's a nation of incredible denial as we are mesmerized <laughs> by our materialism and our consumer goods mm -hmm. and our comfortable lives, but um, 
you know, there was our effort. Oh, that's the shot that's on the cover of my book here. Um, that is about five seconds after I was run over by the train. Um, you can see the horror in people's faces, and I'm on the tracks, and people, I'm on the one lying there on the tracks, and uh, people are already starting to work on stuff in my bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, that was before the Navy ambulance arrived and left. You can see in the lower right my white water bottle. I was starting a 40-day fast that day, so uh, I had my water jug there, and and you can see just barely see that white line. It's really a yellow line, and if it was in color, going kind of right alongside the rail there. You know, going it it, it crosses the rail, right, uh, kind of by the guy whose back is to us, and he's over my legs. Mm -hmm. That was the line that demarcated the public right of way highway from the Navy property, and since my body was lying to the right of that line, the oh Navy ambulance gosh. said that they they uh, were not going to help me. Man. I don't see why that would make any difference if somebody It, it needed, wouldn't make any difference, except it was a part of the plan that day to kill me. Mm-hmm. It was an attempted murder. So, you know... And you weren't the only one on the tracks. There were three of us. Uh, the other two... One jumped to the left, and the second vet jumped straight up and grabbed the railing over the cowcatcher where the two spotters were standing. There's always two spotters on the front of the train in radio contact with the engineer saying, it's clear, all clear. Well, it wasn't all clear. So they're holding the railing. They're standing behind the railing, and the other vet jumped straight up and grabbed the railing works. they were grabbed, grabbing, and then he jumped off. And he was the first person in my body after the train. The train kept going, as you, as, as you can right, see. Right, you don't really. see a train there at all. Now, this is actually uh, one second before I was hit. And my right hand is on the right rail, realizing at this point I better get the heck off the track. And it was going too fast. And my, so my adrenaline at that point was kicked, kicking in, but it was too late. I didn't get off in time. And none of that you remember, though, you say. I don't remember it. But I have 240 photographs for five <laughs> photographers there. I have a video mm -hmm. footage of it, and I have 40 friends uh, who are still traumatized by it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, who tell me about it whenever I see them. Well, uh, let, oh, there we go, another picture. Now, after I uh, recovered from that, um, I went to Nicaragua about six months later uh, to visit people in Nicaragua, because that train was carrying munitions from, to Nicaragua. And I became a hero in, in uh, Nicaragua, and that's President Ortega on the right. That was in that's in March of 1988, March 88, and that's my partner to the left, Holly, who at the time was my partner. She's very much helped save my life on the track. She was a midwife that had a IV in her trunk, so she had IV in me before the uh, the other ambulance wow. came. Um, and they gave me the uh, highest award that they offer to people. Uh, it was called the Augusto Cesar Sandino Award, so that was on my chest. And Ortega had just pinned it on my chest, and this was right after he pinned it, we were mm -hmm. holding arms in the air. It's so incredible you were able to collect all these photographs. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, an interesting photo, because that's Ar Aristide from Haiti, about uh, three and a half months after he was <coughs> inaugurated in 1991 as the first ever elected democratically elected president. He was a liberation theology priest. And uh, that's me immediately to his, I mean, to the right of him. In the headband. With the headband. <laughs> Same headband I probably have on now. <laughs> and uh, what, can we go back to that picture? Sure, let's go back to that there. To the right, in the red shirt, is Jack Ryan. He's the FBI agent who was fired in my case. He went with me to Haiti. In the red shirt? In the red shirt on the right. And then in the, in the there's a white face uh, oh, yeah. Kind of in the middle, that's my brother. It's the only time he ever went with me on a trip. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a retired school teacher from Jamestown, New York. So Do you have any sisters? No. No? And Aristide was overthrown in a CIA, uh, in a, a coup legitimized by the CIA uh, three months after this picture was taken. Yeah, I remember reading about that. So it's not the first time that uh, you, no, we course. have been involved in uh, uh, coups. It happens all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
Oh, I know that the, the word contra. Oh, we have another picture. Now here I am with the. Uh, I'm in. Uh, I'm in Chiapas, Mexico, talking with some Zapatistas in, uh, which had a revolution in you know, January first, nineteen ninety four. Chiapas, yeah. And reclaimed a lot of their land that had been taken from them by the by the mestizos, and so I'm just uh, discussing with them their excitement about their uh, liberation from being serfs and slaves and. And this is a little village deep in the jungle of uh, southern Mexico, and I spent a lot of time in Chiapas. You don't hear much about that anymore. That that, that revolution is still going on. Yeah. There. Yes, it is. Definitely. So uh, yeah, and oh, there I am. I'm a hand cyclist. I've done sixty thousand miles on my hand cycle in the last fourteen years. I'm coming across the uh, Portland Marathon finish line in the marathon of 2009 uh, in the wheelchair hand cycle division and I think that was two hours and 23 minutes or something like that. that's the fifth marathon I've done. Mm -hmm. I've done New York, Boston, LA and Sacramento, California now Portland so that's uh, me finally after 26.2 miles coming across the finish line that's small potatoes compared to you riding your, your bicycle down in yeah, San Francisco. But, you know, I, I like it because <laughs> you don't have it to stop for 26 miles. There's n it, it, the, everything is clear sailing. Mm -hmm. All the all the all the side, uh, you know, there's it's designed to go 26 miles without stopping, so you don't have to stop for stop signs or look for traffic, and uh, so it's kind of a different experience being in a in a marathon. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. Is that the last picture? Do we know if that did we go through them all there? We may have. I we may know. have. I don't. Know. It's good timing because we got about five minutes left. Uh, we've talked about so much, and uh, there's so many things that I thought about picking up the thread later on, but it's 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 far behind me. But but the this whole odyssey you're talking about of of uh, becoming aware of of uh, the true face of our government. Uh, what got me was the uh, realizing the environment. Yeah, it wasn't anti-war. It was what we were doing to well, the environment, our mind, and it's yeah. never gonna. You know, we can't just keep doing this. Our modern way of life uh, in the West, basically a capitalist uh, economics, is at war with life itself. Mm -hmm. It knows no limits. It's constantly expanding and exploiting in order to make profits, and uh, it's literally at war with life itself. Mm -hmm. That's why I say in the book, industrial civilization needs to collapse sooner the better, even though it's going to be horrific, because right. it's on a collision course with life itself, including our life. So do we really want to live in harmony with the environment, or do we want to just say we're going to be a bunch of lemmings that go over the cl racing to the cliff, going over the cliff, all talking on our cell phones and texting, not even knowing what the heck we're doing. Right, and being pushed by the lemmings behind yeah, us. Yeah, and it's know. like, it's kind of insane. Mm -hmm. It's like a mental illness. Uh, I like to think of it as like a mental illness, and we, and it's like we need to be jolted, and we are going to be jolted. We are going to be corrected <coughs> by climate instability, fiscal collapse, and the sh and the shortage, in some cases, the depletion of resources upon which our modern society is dependent. Mm -hmm. And so we will have to look to each other with a simpler technology and realize life is local and we're going to live with less and we're going to actually have a better life because we're going to actually be developing our relationships with one another and the planet. Real mm -hmm. relationships instead of speeding off fast to go from here to there and get all this stuff done and in the meantime we realize we're just destroying our our basic foundation, our water, soil, trees, birds, butterflies, bees, I mean mm -hmm. it's, it's really something. Right, you know, a lot of what you mentioned, bees, frogs, uh, all these different things that, that are we that are slowly disappearing. Them. We don't realize that's all important for our mm -hmm. life. And, and the earth can survive without us, even though it will be dramatically altered, but we can't survive without the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's just a matter of do, do we do we wake up, or as I said, or do we just go with the lemmings over the cliff? And mm -hmm. and it's our choice. And extinction is a correction, as is collapse. Those are corrections from long 
time processes not complying with fundamental principles of sustainability. It's happened to many civilizations in the past, it's happened but we're talking about... It's happened to 25 of them, but now we're talking about the collapse of the species. Of the whole planet. Of the, whole, of the, of the habitability of the planet. Mm -hmm. The planet will survive in some form, and maybe just bacteria, that uh, one-celled organism to start all over Start all over It's done it before. That's right. So... So, uh, but it, it seems kind of foolish that we would knowingly do this, mm -hmm. except to understand that if you've dealt with addiction pathologies, addictions are very tough to break. If you've dealt with alcohol and drug addictions, mm -hmm. why, which I have with a lot of people around me, unless they hit bottom and really grasped that they have to do something different rather than continuing the addiction which is the easy way out to continue the addiction but you know you're destroying your life mm -hmm. and your kids life and your relationship <coughs> so whether we will come to that or not I mean there is definitely a lot of people all over the world and all over this country that are in the process of awakening and it just remains to be seen just how another theme of the book is that we need to learn to be horizontal rather than obedient to vertical structures. And it remains to be seen how much of the horizontal revolution is going to actually now begin to thrive. Mm -hmm. Local, all kinds of local activities designed around sustainability in your community. That's what I call the horizontal revolution. To replace That's our well addiction to vertical obedience, which is not natural, mm -hmm. it's not healthy. I had to go in the military and participate in killing people uh, I, I witnessed in uh, April of 1969 somewhere between seven and nine hundred murdered Vietnamese civ civilians. That's what really woke me up. Mm -hmm. well, we're down to 30 seconds already there, Brian. It, it went really fast. Wish we had more time. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking about your book. Uh, you can get it at the bookstore. Get it at the bookstore. It's, uh, it's, it's well worth the read. Uh, I looked a little bit at it myself. I'm going to look at it more. Uh, Blood on the tracks. Blood on the tracks, and you got impressed. You got to have a thick skin to read it. <laughs> yeah, it's not a it's not a feel good book. Not a feel good book. Well, that's well put. I want to thank the crew for the work they did, and uh, we'll thank Brian again for coming in. We'll be here next week, and uh, we'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in.